panel of esteemed activists who will be sharing their thoughts and their experiences and their knowledge with us tonight. My name is Tabitha St. Bernard Jacobs. I am the Director of Community Engagement at Women's March. Um, I'm going to be giving a brief overview of our time together and then do a little bit of framing and then we'll jump right into the panel and then we'll open it up um, for Q&A with you all and then we will close. Um, we have a little over 200 people signed up tonight. Thank you so much for doing what you had to do to be here with us. We know these times are anything but normal and we are literally all reeling from the impact of this virus on our communities. Um, I'm going to invite everybody to introduce yourselves in the chat. You can put your name, your location, and just a word to describe how you're feeling right now. Um, and I'm going to also try to stop that dinging on my phone. Um, uh, and if we, so I'm just going to do a little bit of introduction. There's a little box at the bottom of your screen for Q&A. Um, you can drop all your all of your questions in there. We're probably not going to be able to answer all of the questions. We'll get to as many as possible. Um, for those of you on the phone, um, we we think you might be able to join us on the chat, but you but we will be doing a, a poll, and you probably will not be able to join us for the poll. We're sorry about that. We do have closed captioning available, which is the button at the bottom of the screen, which will pop up. Um, which will pop up if you click on it next to the Q&A button. And this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel tomorrow. So feel free to look out for that tomorrow. If you want to share it with other people, um, we welcome that. So now we'll just take a second to pause and do a poll just to get an idea of uh, who we're talking to. And we'll launch the poll right now. Um, for those of you not if everybody can please mute themselves if everybody can please mute themselves thank you so much um we're asking what region are people coming from are you an immigrant if you're comfortable with sharing with others do you come from an immigrant family if you're comfortable sharing are you actively organizing in support of undocumented communities um and if and how are you participating in this activism um if you are indeed doing that so we'll just give people two minutes to fill out that poll. Um, I'm seeing people in the chat saying you feel overwhelmed, um, saying that you feel exhausted. Hi, Karen from Minnesota. You feel grounded in community, Akemi. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, uh, Lauren from Tennessee. Lisa from South, Car from South Carolina. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh so many people from all over the country who are coming looking for more information and we are honored to be joined by our panelists so that we can provide some more information for you as to how you can help in terms of advocating for and with people who are undocumented tina from san diego hi tina from san diego Mejia from Denver, Colorado. Thank you so much for joining us. We're now up to 234 people on the webinar. Feel free to, uh, to fill out the poll um, and then we can move on from there. Um, hi, Danny. Danny from Raleigh, thank you for joining us. The poll should pop up on your screen, or if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little, um, a little polling button at the bottom. You can click on that and fill out the poll. Mary, I'm from Brooklyn. Mary, our hearts are with you in New York City right now. Thank you so much for joining. We have somebody from India, Pooja from India. We're thinking about you, Pooja. Ending the poll in about 10 seconds. Um, yes, just thank you so much to everyone that's joining in. Puzzled about ways to help from Nancy. Nancy, hopefully we can provide some guidance for you on the call today about ways that you can help. We're gonna be providing some very actionable items at the end of the webinar, so stay tuned for that. 
Lynn from Florida, thank you for joining us. So we're gonna be wrapping up the poll right about now. Thank you so much to everyone who has um, filled out the results. We're just gonna wait a couple minutes. Here we go. Um, we have a lot of people from the Southeast. Thank you everyone who's joining from the Midwest, from the West. We have uh, a, about 18% of people on the call from the Midwest, 31% from the Northeast. Um, most people on the call today are not actually in are not actually immigrants. We only have 14% 14, 14 of people on the call who have identified as yes to the question of are they an immigrant? Um, and also from the question of if you come from an immigrant family, 63% of you all said, no, you do not. So we're gonna be providing ways um, where you can be an ally for, for those who, who need that the most. Um, if you're actively organizing in support of undocumented communities, 33% of you said yes, so, and 43% of you said no. So we are, we're going to be providing some information about how you can get involved on this call, especially at the end of the call, so stay, stay tuned. Um, we have some people who are getting involved in terms of mutual aid for undocumented families. 13% um, of you have engaged in direct action at a detention center. Um, and 20% of you have been lobbying a public figure. So thank you to everyone for all that you, you have been doing. Uh, so I'm just gonna give a little bit of framing right now. Given the existing and increasing threats of the coronavirus, Women's March understands that many women in our constituency will be feeling overwhelmed and isolated and unsure of where to turn for tools and supports like many of you have said in the chat today. And we feel that too. We also know that we need to come together to be able to understand not only the personal, but also the political implications of this moment and how to act, especially in a time of social distancing. So this is why we're offering webinars like this and many more initiatives we'll talk about at the end of the call. Women are and will remain on the front lines of this pandemic in many ways. With our paid and unpaid labor, we do the majority of care, caretaking for the sick, the vulnerable, and the, and the old and the young. We also know that the way power and discrimination and inclusion work in this society is that when crisis and disaster hits, it doesn't strike all of us the same way. Those that already suffer at the hands of economic and social discrimination and oppression, they really suffer the most. And that includes people who are black and also people of color, those that are undocumented, those that, those that, that are disabled, those that are poor or working class, and those that are queer and gender non-conforming. So this might be a little bit of a refresher for many of you on the call, but there are upwards of 11 million undocumented people who call this country home. They're not able to vote. They're not able to access basic social services. They pay billions of dollars in taxes and provide far before this pandemic, really essential labor and life force to this country. And even while their very existence has been demonized. These are also the communities that Trump really continues to target and is trying to cut the wages of workers while they are literally providing us a lifeline and keeping our systems working. A small percentage of our undocumented siblings have DACA, which is around 700,000, and around 300,000 people have TPS. Both of these are legal statuses granted by the US government. We know that ICE is a rogue agency that really kidnaps, cages, and deports thousands. The existence of these detention centers are an abomination, as are the conditions inside, where we know the coronavirus is also running rampant. We support wholeheartedly many of our partners who are leading work to free them all. And that includes the need to release those in jails and also detention centers before they are fully ravaged by the coronavirus. And as some of you may know already, there is a detention center in actually Illinois where there are immigrant kids and they actually just confirmed 19 cases of the coronavirus. We know that people should be shown justice and also compassion and humanity at our borders and in our communities. We're thrilled this evening to have a beautiful panel with us tonight to dive deeper into some of these questions and to really delve into conversation. So I just wanna take a moment here to encourage everybody to take a deep breath in and to hold that breath for four seconds four, three, two, one, and let it out. 
so we can ground ourselves in this moment. I'm gonna be introducing our panelists this evening. Um, thank you so much, the three of you for joining us. Uh, Tolu Alishin Lawyer, who's an immigration activist. We also have with us Alyssa Setut, who's a TPS organizer with Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees. And we have Sarah Mora, who's a national immigrant rights activist and a digital strategist. So let's delve right into the panel. I'm gonna ask all the panelists to please Please introduce yourselves and paint a picture of how the coronavirus impacts the communities that you are a part of. Maybe we can start with Sarah. I think Tolu is going to dive in if she wants to go ahead. She okay. can. You want me to go? Okay, go ahead. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, hope you're all well and healthy. My name is Tolu Aleshanlaya. Um, I am a DACA recipient, um, and I live in New York City, um, and I advocate for DACA, recipient, DACA recipients, um, and in particular, the Black undocumented community um, here in New York City. And um, I live in the heart of Harlem, and, you know, I hear sirens outside my window all day, every day. Um, I know that the Black community is disproportionately impacted by uh, this virus, and we, I won't even go into details, you know, um, on, you know, the reasons for all of that, but I think we all kind of know um, societal issues that are impacting um, our community. So um, it's been a really challenging time, you know, not only to be sort of in limbo in terms of uh, DACA and the Supreme Court uh, decision, but also being hit with um, this virus um, in this community has been, you know, really challenging. And I'm really, you know, fortunate that I have a, you know, job where I can work from home and work remotely and those types of things. I'm really blessed in that way. But to see, you know, how this has all ravaged uh, this community has been um, extremely challenging. But I also think that this is such an opportunity for um, us all to uh, have some, a little bit of, have for Americans at large, uh, American uh, citizens at large, to have a little more empathy for uh, this community. I see how, you know, many of my colleagues have fled to the Hamptons, have fled to um, various cities uh, to protect their children and their health. And, you know, I think it is a time for us to, you know, really see the similarities of the impact of um, unrest and, um, any socioeconomic things that happen in communities that force people out of their homes. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Tolo. Melissa, do you want to go next? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Melissa Situ. I am 23 years old. I currently live in Brooklyn, New York. I am a TPS holder myself, and including my parents. My parents are TPS holders. I came to, the, to the United States from Haiti at the age of nine years old. Currently, I work as an advocate counselor at a transfer high school where I provide services and support to immigrant students ages 15 to 22 who are over age for their grade and undercredited. I guide these students toward removing barriers in education and in, on employment. I am also a TPS organizer with Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees a nonprofit organization in Brooklyn, New York. I am a member of the National TPS Alliance Executive Committee and Youth Committee. As a member of the Haitian community and also as uh, a TPS holder, coronavirus has affected, uh, has had a tremendous impact on my community. For those of us who have TPS, we are deeply concerned over the future of TPS as we still live in legal uncertainty, not knowing when our status will end. Uh, many TPS holders are what you would consider essential workers, including bus drivers, Uber drivers, delivery workers, construction workers, specifically healthcare workers, ranging from nurses, nurses aides, home health aides, and people cleaning houses, and um, people who provide food service and healthcare facilities. My mom, for example, who works as a health, health, uh, health aid worker, um, she has to continue to work and she has to take public transportation to go 
uh, to private homes, as well as uh, other nurses who work in nursing homes, TPS holders specifically who work in, in um, nursing homes and hospitals, they are put, they are put in a, at risk uh, with or without personal protection equipment being supplied to them. Not only are they putting themselves at risk when they, when they have to go out every day, but they come home to their families and have to worry about the possibility of infecting them after being exposed. TPS holders and cleaning, and cleaning businesses and who are working um, and who, who are working, some of them have con uh, contracted the virus. Uh, TPS holders, for example, um, have contracted the virus. So that has a big impact on them. Here in New York, we have passed uh, the 10,000 death toll rate of COVID-19 related death. Most of us, if not all, know someone who has died as a result of this pandemic. The most difficult part, I would say, is that you don't, you don't um, have the opportunity to organize a funeral where loved ones can have a respectful send off. Additionally, many folks have been laid off of work. For example, there is a, a woman from the National TPS Alliance who, who works at a hotel who has been laid off. She has a family to take care of, and it's, it's really hard on, on her. And also for all of those who, are, who doesn't have a job, who cannot work from home. So that's really tough. And um, for those who are also eligible for unemployment, I know it has been a challenge to apply because initially over multiple people were all trying to apply at once. And at some point, the Department of Labor system um, online, their website was crashing. So I think now people are starting to apply and they have been successful. But it's, it's also nearly impossible to get people on the phone. Um, meanwhile, people uh, struggle with food insecurities and are wondering how and, and when they will be able to pay rent. And if a person is un totally undocumented without a protected status like DACA or TPS, the fear of deportation has intensified. Just last week, they resumed deportation um, to Haiti, and a lot of those people that they have deported to Haiti, I believe, have the virus. And Haiti is not doesn't have the the resources, the good the resources to provide assistance for those people, you know, who may spread the virus. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Sarah? Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Mora. I have DACA, and um, I started organizing when I was 14 and got more involved or full-time involved um, in 2017 when Trump rescinded DACA. And the more that I organized, I realized that storytelling for undocumented communities was never really owned by the people impacted by the policy, but rather just a subsequent of being involved in organizing. So I began to be really passionate about the possibility of digital organizing being really accessible to um, the communities impacted by um, immigration the most. And during this pandemic, it's taken me a while to, my mom cleans houses, my dad's a mechanic, um, my sister also has DACA, and I think my biggest concern was trying to process everything first because I knew it wasn't going to be something that would just sit in place and remain the same. I knew that per state policies would work differently and gover governors would take action at different paces. So. Now I am back on my feet. Yesterday, I actually officially made some more firm calls and I'm going to be taking direct action. I'm going to be launching a national campaign tomorrow on rent relief that will provide $200 per families. And my goal is to fundraise an insane amount of money to reach as many families because um, that's something that is at my reach right now. And using my platform as an influencer, that's going to be more possible because of the reach that I have. We're also going to be hosting a phone bank for um, my commun my friends at the border who run different um, spaces to advocate for um, migrants in detention centers. And we're going to be running a phone bank called Free Them All because OT Mesa Detention Resistance, which is an org that I worked with directly last year at the border, um, it has the most cases of COVID-19. And as we stated before, that's not something that the government is reacting upon. Instead, 
It is up to us as people who are outside of detention centers and those who have even more accessibility to join actions like phone banks to take direct action and to swarm a elected official's um, phone line is exactly what it looks like to act in a time like COVID. And um, I'm also gonna be working with the Garment Worker Center um, just to try to give a variety of options to people um, in capacity of ways that they can help undocumented communities. I also have a friend who leads an initiative called Undocu Professionals, who's actually hosting a Zoom call right now with professors that are helping undocumented um, TPS, DACA recipient, and different um, varieties between that college students um, sort of sort their issues during um, the graduation process or for those who had a year left, a lot of concerns that students have. And overall, I'm just really looking forward to the follow-up that I'll be able to be a part of and sharing resources in ways because there's a lot of actions that are already happening and so many ways that even if you're not an immigrant, you can contribute. Um, and I'm really thankful for um, this call and the fact that I'm able to um, share space with Tolu and Melissa because I feel like it's different legal statuses, but we're equally as, as just ignored when it comes to storytelling. So your stories are so relevant to the work that I do. And I'm really excited that other people were able to hear about y'all, even though it's such a critical time to hear your story. So Sarah, you touched on this a little bit. You talked a little bit about Zaka and about some ways that, um, um, people can support the work that you're doing. Can you talk a little bit about how the undocumented community is supporting each other right now? Yeah, so it's been pretty spread out. Um, I think like, again, firsthand, because I had just come from the border, I tried to take a step back at first to not, to sort of give room to what would already naturally happen, which is like a lot of local fundraising. Um, there's been so many fundraisers on GoFundMe, obviously. And then there's just been orgs that are attempting to donate food, get food delivered. Things have been pretty, um, I would say difficult just because of the fact that depending on how you do outreach, you can't target, right? Undocumented families, you can't have people to basically make themselves a target. But I think people are doing a lot locally. I've been seeing a lot of small actions and small actions are the big ones because you're seeing them all across the country. So I think, Again, I'm mentioning now something like a phone bank swarm because at a local level, people are doing everything to their capacity that they can. But then you also have um, folks that are undocumented themselves trying to deliver food to other folks who have to go to the emergency room, let's say for, um, for uh, any checkups that they may have when they have their... Um, they have to go to the emergency room. And so to me, how I see it is like, they're doing a lot for how much we're already risking going into a hospital without proper insurance. So that's why for me, it's taken kind of, again, stepping back and seeing how people who are not directly impacted could best help because I think at a local level, what I'm seeing and from seeing my friends in different state colleges, people are doing everything they can. But again, governments vary between state and everybody's actions are a lot different so many different paces that it makes it hard to collectively agree on an action. But I would say again, yeah, everybody's literally doing everything they can. The undocumented community is reacting as fast as they can. There's radio stations um, doing like food deliveries and just people trying to provide the small way. Mm -hmm. Melissa, can you talk a little bit about what the NTPSA is doing in order to keep the TPS campaign going? Um, like I said um, earlier, I'm part of the National TPS Alliance Executive Committee and Youth Committee. Right now, because of uh, COVID-19, a lot of the things that we are doing are obviously online through Zoom, through phone calls and um, voice messages on WhatsApp, we have created multiple groups uh, so that we can keep in contact with uh, the organization that we work with. Uh, we, are, we are working towards uh, uh, having a, a Zoom call where we have an assembly that's in the 
talks. We might have an assembly real soon uh, where we usually have it um, in uh, Washington, D.C., and we usually visit legislators, but obviously that's going to be online. Mm -hmm. it, might, it might go a different direction, but that's a way we want to keep in contact with uh, our members. And we are also reaching out to legislators through emails. We are making sure that they know that we are still working, even though uh, we are quarantined, we are still working on um, permanent residency, which is the goal. And also we are working to help those, those uh, TPS holders who, are, who need the help, who need funds, for example. So um, yeah, so we've basically been doing a lot of work on that. And um, yeah, we continue the campaign through online resources. It's, forgot to unmute myself, sorry. Um, Tolu, you touched on this earlier about the experience of being a Black DACA recipient during this pandemic. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, my family uh, comes from Nigeria, uh, which was recently added to the ban list um, a few months back by this administration. So this has been one hit after another for you know black DACA recipients, um, but as well as you know Afri people from of African descent overall. I mean, we've heard. Um, I, I do have family in Nigeria who, who actually have contracted um, the coronavirus um, through other family members in uh, London, and um, to even just hear um, potentially uh, testing happening in Africa and just the way that you know African communities have been targeted in China um, during this pandemic, I think it's just indicative of the struggle that continues to you know, happen no matter where black and brown faces um, exist. Um, and just you know, holding space anywhere is dangerous um, for our communities. But um, I, you know, I'll definitely say that you know, the organizations that I've worked with, I've worked with uh, Forward uh, US uh, to lobby Congress around um, some of these issues, but you know, our, you know, we are still a minority even in the, um, you know, community, the DACA community. Um, so make, making sure that our voices are heard is the most important thing, and making sure that we're seen. And I think um, one thing that I think is really important is to make sure that the people that are around you that are U.S. citizens are voting and understand how um, the people that are impacted by the policies. Um, are being impacted. Sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there for a second. It's a really stressful time. But yeah, I, I think uh, when Trump ended, uh, rescinded DACA, um, I actually had to stop, you know, working completely. And I think many of my friends and colleagues really did not understand the impact of uh, the policies that are being made through Congress, through the Senate, and all of those things. So I think it's really important that. Um, your friends and your colleagues and anyone on here who considers themselves an ally, um, if we can really talk about voting and the importance of um, legislation that impacts all of these policies, I know that there's, you know, at the president level, there's one thing, but you know, Congress and the Senate has the um, ability to uh, write these things into law and really create legislation. And I think that's such an important. I think it's something that doesn't always. Get talked about. I think it's something that's so important. I work with my friend um, Esther, who has something called the Love Vote, and we worked to um, essentially encourage all of our loved ones to vote on our behalf. And we don't have the ability to vote, but I think, you know, oftentimes, especially in the Black community, we don't think that our vote matters. We don't think that um, we'll have an impact, but you know, I think through sharing my story, and I think Sarah, you made a really good point about sharing our stories. It's so important as people who I grew up with, I've been in the country since I was three years old, who I didn't even know I was undocumented. You know, we, we tend to just blend into the country because we don't have an accent and we don't, um, we don't necessarily, you know, have the same experience that our parents have experienced. So um, I do wanna really stress that, you know, if you are an ally, you know, talk to your friends who are undocumented and talk about the impact of the policies and how their vote can actually change the trajectory of all of this. Um, the Supreme Court, it's, it's in the hands of the Supreme Court right now, DACA, but I think 
you know, depending on which way it goes, it's still going to, a law still has to be created in order to provide a path to citizenship or any type of legal uh, status. Um, and I think it's just really important to just, you know, share that across black and brown communities that, you know, if you do have the ability to vote, please vote on our behalf because that is the voice that um, can change things in this country. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, Sarah, how can folks support people in detention centers and particularly migrants in border town detention facilities? Yeah, all of last year I dedicated it to working or learning beside border towns because I think there are so many different communities within the migration conversation, right? So even within border towns, I think it's really important for people to take the lead of people already doing the work in border towns. And I think it's amazing that there's so many people that want to help. So because there is so much, um, you know, you know, sensitivity in a time like right now, I'm working with friends from the border to compile a list of actions, including things like phone banks for particular representatives. Um, and it's important for us to lead, to follow their lead because they're the ones living in those communities and know exactly the politics of those um, local environments. Um, so I think it's, that's something we're actively working on. As I shared before, storytelling and reclaiming narrative for a lot of migrant communities does not come easy because migrants are working. You migrants are attempt are providing for their families. So it is a luxury to be able to tell your story. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be able to um, strive to be a digital strategist full time because that would be the goal of a strategist as an organizer to essentially hand over the mic and help migrants of all communities tell their own story and own their own story. So how people can help is by hearing people's stories and by definitely looking at the follow-up that we're going to share because I'm going to include a diverse list of way of communities that people can help, including um, the communities of people um, in migrant detention, in detention centers right now. And to remember that migration is a crisis. I say that on Instagram all the time because a lot of things are a crisis, but migration is really intense and communities are really humble and grateful that migrate. So I feel like we make struggle look good, but Mig like migrant families go through a lot. We just do it with a lot of color and a lot of laughs. And I think it's important to hear others because then we're able to in the even most minimal way empathize and understand that we never really understand anyone else for our own story best right so by hearing others out and taking the lead of people in their own communities we are doing world changing and detrimental work because there is no more radical work than work led by the people impacted so i'm excited to share the follow-up email with um actions Sarah, you said something that's like so important and we know we took the poll earlier this evening and we know that um, more than half the people on this call are not actually immigrants or not actually undocumented. So are looking for ways that they can be allies. And you said something really important, which is to pass the mic. It's not on you to tell the story of an immigrant or of somebody who's undocumented. You need to pass the mic if you have the resources, if you have the mic, if you have the platform, pass that mic to somebody who's actually impacted. Um, so, Melissa, I have a question. How, how are young undocumented people, especially young people, being affected by COVID-19? Um. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, well, think that um, undocumented people are only like older folks, parents, but the fact is that a lot of folks are also undocumented, like myself, I, I am undocumented, and I know a few people who are also undocumented, and they are deeply affected by uh, this pandemic because um, a lot of them a lot of them are also have been laid off from work. Uh, for example, students who work at restaurants, fast food, um, who works uh, at movie theaters, for example, they are unable to work right now. They are at home. And a lot of them, they depend on that to pay out of pocket for school because 
uh, TPS holders are not eligible for financial aid. So they have to pay out of pocket. So a lot of these students are actually very scared. You know, uh, we, we try to give them words of encouragement, but it is really hard, especially tr um, changing from going to school, like face to face, high school students going to school, to their classes, seeing their peers or seeing their teachers face to face as, a, uh, as an interaction. But now they have to like um, change that and try to learn how to manage that, um, the work at home and also other youth are also working at home for example for me i work at a high school so i have to manage time with um doing organizing work and also doing my own work uh which requires a lot of my attention where i have to be consistent consistently on phone calls with students who are in crisis so that's a lot to deal with because um also youth including myself, have parents with TPS and who are actually not working. So that's actually very scary because yes, they are eligible for unemployment, but they also have other bills that they have to take care of, you know? And um, for example, my dad who works at a school and he's currently not working right now. So a lot of that has affects the the youth as well because they're overthinking they have so much they have to handle themselves and they're thinking so much and um also the uncertainty with tps right um for example with haiti it was terminated in 2017 and um a total of 12 other countries, it, uh, TPS was also terminated, right? We have been able to stay in status as a result of uh, lawsuits against the Trump administration, specifically the case Ramos uh, versus Nielsen litigation. And it has protected um, TPS holders. And it has, um, <clears throat> because of that uh, case, TPS have been extended to January 2021 and at the moment we are still waiting to for the decision for that specific case so all of that all together with uh with work with school uh family problems so all of that has obviously a big effect on the youth thank you so much um Tolu as a New Yorker how do you think the pandemic has revealed the unrest and the instability that leads many immigrant parents to make the challenging decision to bring their children to safety in this country? And do you think this will make people any more empathetic? Yeah, Tabitha, I think that's a good question. I think I, I talked about it a little bit you know, before, but I work in an industry where People are quite privileged and um, it was a no brainer for them. You know, when this happened, okay, I'm just gonna go to the Hamptons. I'm just gonna go somewhere else. And I think a lot of them take for granted to just be able to pick up and go. And when something like this that's unprecedented that has happened, um, you know, if they had to go to, through the process that our parents would have had to go through or most immigrants have to go through, I don't think most Americans would ever be able to even sort through most of the legal um, processes that you have to go through in terms of immigration. So, you know, I think it, I, I, I speak about it a lot and I think it's really important that we do speak about the similarities in terms of, you know, what, while people are leaving their homes right now to go to cities that are not theirs um, and taking up space in those cities um, and taking up resources in those cities, um, I think that you know, the empathy has to go in, you know, in both directions. I think we do need to think about, you know, these, you know, immigrant communities um, have been ravaged all around the world and they've, they've come to this country for a reason. And, you know, my family, I was three years old when my parents um, came to the country. And, um, you know, I think, I, I would like to hope that New York, New Yorkers um, who have fled or people who have, you know, found a temporary home elsewhere will, you know, now, hopefully have a little bit of empathy for uh, immigrant families overall. And I think um, we've been seeing, you know, New Yorkers come to have to come together um, 
across the board, across all socioeconomic backgrounds um, to help one another. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about New York, like we're a gritty city, like we, we, we know how to work together to figure things out. But I, what my hope is that um, these communities don't come back, everyone doesn't just come back to New York City and just business as usual. Um, I really do hope that we are able to tell these stories and really connect the dots that, yeah, you were able to get your children to safety because you left um, a city that was under siege <laughs> or, uh, under a virus that we were not able to control. There's civil war that breaks out in other countries that brings people to um, America. And in that same way, let's have that same empathy for these families, um, especially young children. You know, I, I see, of course, you want to get your children to safety, but, you know, all of us were brought to this country um, as very young children for one reason or another. And um, I think that conversation has gotten lost um, that many of us, you know, I actually didn't know my status until I was older. Um, I actually found out later because many parents, you know, are protecting their children from even knowing what's going on. Many parents, you know, are really trying to make sure that they're doing the best they can and raising their children and hoping, you know, for the best and things for things to be worked out. And um, that was the case in my family. And I know that's the case in you know, thousands of other families. So, you know, I really, one of my goals is really to um, expand empathy across, you know, all races, all, um, all religions um, across the board. I think um, that will get us, you know, such a long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people talk about going back to normal or going back to the way things were. And that's probably not what's best for us. I think I, I agree with you. The hope is that this experience leaves people more, more empathetic, a lot more understanding to people who don't have as much privilege as they do. So I have a question for everyone. Um, uh, as we wrap things up and open it up to questions, um, what are some of the resources and organizations and things that you can refer people to um, who want to help, who want to support, um, how can people support undocumented immigrants and also their families? Um, our organizing efforts at National TPS Alliance and on the local level with Haitian women for Haitian refugees continue strongly, whether we are using Zoom, Facebook, and um, forums and urging legislat legislators to include us in relief programs. And um, if you want to help, uh, you feel free to visit the National TPS Alliance website. There's a lot of information there. And they're also working on putting out testimonies on the website. If you, need, if you want more information about the, the, the case, Ramos versus Nielsen, feel free to visit the website. We also have Instagram, National TPS Alliance. Um, and Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees also have a, uh, a Facebook and Instagram. And if you want to donate, feel free to donate. If you want to contact us, if you want to be a part of the movement, please feel free. If you have anyone who have TPS or Haitian TPS holders, um, give them the information. They can just go to the website and contact us directly, whether through email or uh, through the phone. And I know somebody asked a question about unemployment. And um, the stimulus package, yes, um, TPS holders can apply for unemployment. I actually started the application with my dad um, yesterday. You can apply. And for the stimulus package, yes, TPS holders can apply. As long as they have a social security number, they can definitely apply. But um, I want to say that um, I feel like uh, this movement is very important. As you all know, it is very personal to me, for my family. This is a continuous fight for all undocumented individuals out here because we deserve to be here. And the fight right now is not only permanent residency, which is the goal for the National TPS Alliance, it's also a fight against COVID-19. And we, the National TPS Alliance is, is working on fundings and we hope to get a lot of support from other organizations and other people. And um, we're not going to stop. Um, the the COVID-19 is not going to stop us from continuing our work. And we hope to hear from a lot of people here. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And just to add a note for everyone, we are going to be following up with an email 
um, within the next coming days with some of the links and information that the panelists are mentioning on the call. Um, Sarah, do you want to go next? Yeah, I want to say that um, I'm going to be again addressing very sort of random ways that the community is going to be receiving uh, support during this time. So um, I dropped my at name and if people are interested in getting involved, aside from the follow up, you can also just feel free to DM me directly for the particular ways to take action. There's a big um, committee that I'm that we're working on building for language barrier because we know and we've received the proof that a lot of migrant communities are not receiving enough information on COVID. Um, not to even mention healthcare, like I mentioned before, people don't feel comfortable going to the hospital because of language barrier. Um, so again, as you said, you're going to be doing the follow-up, but I think it's so important that even in a time like this, people see the intensity of with which certain communities are impacted. And um, there are people that are departed. There are people in my community that have already passed away. I got about five deaths just from my local community today. So I appreciate every single person that's tuned in. And it's really important for us to have allies supporting because there are moments where undocumented people cannot be the ones serving um, or holding space in certain environments, but it does not mean we're voiceless. It just means that a movement is built upon many different um, people. So I thank all of you, and I really look forward to sharing that follow-up information. And yes, language barrier is an issue, so that is going to be addressed. Tolu, did you want to comment on the question? Sure. Um... Yeah, I would say, and I, I, I've already repeated this, but I can't say it enough. Um, I, I know that uh, in, in certain communities, voting um, is something that we have not done, but I implore every single person to, as a first step, find out who your senator and your congressperson is. Um, you can easily do that online and just put in your zip code. Um, a lot of the issues that you know are, are impacting our communities come down to the, these local elections. and really find out what your local um, representatives um, are doing to support immigrant communities. Um, I think it's just so important that we don't forget about their role in this. They work for us. And if you are an ally and you are someone who um, is a citizen, I really, really um, would tell you to tell, for you to look up who your senator is and tell five friends um, and really, um, take them to task about what they're doing to support uh, immigrant communities and um, these policies that we've all talked about today. Um, I can't stress that enough. Um, and, you know, I, I, I co-sign what every, everything that Sarah and Melissa have said about um, all of the resources that are out there, but I just, I just don't want to skip over that important thing. Being in an election year, I just think it's so important that we get registered to vote and have our voices heard um, and keep, have people have our voices heard on our behalf as well. So thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to open it up to some questions. Again, if you have questions for the panelists, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Feel free to add your questions there. We're going to try to get as many as we can. Um, so one question that's come up several times in the Q&A section is um, you all are speaking very openly about being undocumented. Um, how can people protect you all from being put at risk and making you all targets um, for ICE? I guess that I can go. I, I think we've all had to come to a place where we have just said we had to be open about our status. And I think there's actually strength in um, actually being transparent and having our names out there. I think, you know, public outcry is really important. I think, I think being able to um, have a community of people that are around you that are supporting you and having your name out there, while it's, it's initially very scary, I think there's, you know, power in people knowing that, like, we're not in the shadows. We're not people that you can just erase and dismiss, that we're people who are standing and strong and that if you do come after us, there will be people who are behind us. So 
um, I think just being supportive of any undocumented person that you know, being supportive and, you know, um, to Sarah's great point, like passing that mic, I think is so important. I think there was, there's so much fear in our communities and if people are able to stand up, it's just having other people help lift, those, lift up those stories and, you know, hold hands with us, I think is the most important thing. Um, it, it, I don't think, I think the hiding part is over for, you know, whoever has decided to uh, step forward. It's just more having that allyship um, and continuing to, you know, pass that mic uh, to Sarah's point, I think is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's also, I want to just also add that I think it's critical to, within the context of passing the mic, to support, again, initiatives that are okayed by undocumented people that are doing the work because it's detrimental for those impacted to have, you know, <laughs> lead in this work. So it's really um, important for me, I would say, and for most of my community, I would, I'd speak, I would dare to speak on behalf for people to essentially support that, that work that they see led by the community themselves, because there's a lot of work within the community, they just don't have the luxury again of amplifying it. So it's a real help when folks can help uplift resources led by Melissa and by Tolu and by those that are experience, experiencing it firsthand. That's how you also help us. It's not that, again, as Tolu said, that we're voiceless, but that it, it, it is really helpful in amplifying the voices of those who are already putting themselves at risk because we're doing it in the name of a lot of people who don't have the luxury to get on a call. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We have a few. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to add to that. I agree with both Sarah and Tolu. And um, something that the National TPS Alliance always say, nothing about us without us. Um, I agree with Sarah and Tolu when you guys say that um, our, it, our stories matter. It's always best when we tell our stories where, where we share our own testimonies, I would say. So a way to support is to just um, be a part of the allies, you know, um, participate and get more people involved, I would say. So that's, that's my point on that. And that leads into a couple of people have questions about um, places where they can donate funds, where they can donate. Um, I know that Melissa mentioned NTPSA and um, we're also going to be adding some of that information in the email that's going to go out after this call as well. Um, anybody want to chime in about funds that people can find easily? Yeah, so I'm going to be launching tomorrow morning a rent relief campaign that's going to go directly to migrant families. The vetting process is going to be obviously very tricky, but it's all for families. Like there's no dollar going towards anything else. So it'd be really appreciated if when we do share those resources, if people can share and donate, because that's one quick, immediate way to provide rent for families who are... Um, who like my mother, for example, that cleans houses, cannot clean houses during this time because they just lost their job immediately for factory workers, mechanics, and people who are simply not able to make ends meet right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Sarah Palmer. Um, she's a teacher and she often helps and submits DACA applications and renewals. Um, she has some that's just been resubmitted for renewal and one that was pending fingerprints. Um, but she knows that a lot of this has been postponed indefinitely and there's concern about what that means for her students' DACA status and what will happen if it expires. Can anyone speak to that or point her to a resource where she can get some more information? I'll have to double check it, but I believe the USCIS has said that they will um, allow biometrics from prior um, renewals to be used. So I would double check the site, but I, I, I did see that. And there are a few people that I know who have resubmitted it with um, the existing biometrics. Mm -hmm. That's confirmed, by the way. Yeah, totally. Okay. Okay. We have someone who's asking for tips to tell your stories as youth advocates. How did you get the courage to share your story publicly? Well, I guess I can go. Um, I, I, I actually started with who I knew. I started with the people already around me, which was 
extremely terrifying. Um, you know, I, as I said, I grew up as any American child, and I, I at a, a, a later age, found out that I was undocumented. So truly, it was like no one really knew. And then I partnered um, on this Love Vote project, and people that I've known for several years, I shared it on Facebook, and people that I had no idea um, would even care or, you know, know, know anything about um, immigration. And um, they, they were all just immediately um, moved by my story and they immediately shared it. And then now, you know, I get text messages every day, you know, what does this mean? And they're following the Supreme Court news. I think it's so important. I think sometimes you see people on these big platforms and you want to do something huge, but starting where you are, I think is so important. Um, and, you know, starting small and building up to something larger, I think is um, the best way to go in, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I would say for me as a youth, um, I know it, it's pretty scary to share your your status with people. Like when I was in high school, nobody nobody really knew I was undocumented until I met the director of Haitian Women for Haitian Refugees. She introduced me um, to the National TPS Alliance, and the first um, the first uh, assembly that they had. That's when I was exposed to all these different people from all these different countries who are in the same situation as me and from there I started being comfortable sharing my story I feel like it's all about it it's all about um being a part of an organization or being around people that you're comfortable with I feel like that that would help a lot um hearing from other youths or hearing from older even older adults I feel like that would motivate a lot of youths to come out and also if they see that a lot of organizations are working on TPS, because that's, I feel like that's a lot of, that's, that's one thing that a lot of youth don't know, you know, when they're not out there, they don't know that there is actually people working on TPS, but I feel like it's all about, you know, meeting the right person and being a part of the right organization. I feel like that will make them feel more comfortable to share their story. Thank you. I so just want to add one second that like when storytelling, like, one thing that I wish I was told when I was 15 sharing my story of being undocumented was that it's not your obligation, right? Like you should always feel, you should always feel like it was your decision to tell your story. So it's very important to be careful and to acknowledge your own feelings when doing that. I know I shared my story in a very traumatic and triggering policy change time. So I love storytelling because it is empowering. Like I've always felt empowered protesting and telling my story, but it took some time because unfortunately in the beginning, it wasn't something that I was fully consciously doing by decision, but more by desperation. And to know that your story is really valuable and um, your life is valuable. So just take your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. So we have a lot more questions, but it is nine o'clock and we do need to wrap up. Um, we are going to be sending out an email with more resources from our panelists tomorrow. So hopefully you'll be able to find answers to your questions um, in that email. Just want to extend an immense thank you and gratitude to all of the panelists for coming on so bravely sharing your stories and sharing your experiences and sharing your knowledge um, with everyone on the call and with our network. Um, Women's March is launching a range of initiatives to address the changing needs of this moment over the next few months, and we'll be focusing on three main areas. The first one is harnessing the power of everyday women to hold the powerful corporations and governments accountable in this crisis and demand a bottom-up bailout as we go all in for all of us. We're also conducting a women to women census, which is an inventory of our people skills and interests and experiences, which we would love for you to contribute to. Um, you can sign up to our mailing list at womensmarch.com to get that census. And we've also launched Mask Up, which is a multi-pronged public education campaign to teach about safe mask wearing and share some of our partners who are leading campaigns for folks to make and send masks to those in need and also sewing circles to build community. And also education and also connection as we continue to bring you more webinars like this one and more and more information. Um, just as a reminder, Women's March will be sharing out this recording. You can find it on our YouTube channel, 
um, by the end of the day tomorrow um, and sharing all of the resources that we talked about as well. So again, a huge thank you to everybody who was able to join us tonight, to our panelists, to everybody that asked a question. Thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Stay safe, stay indoors. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.